Hey, what's going on, champs? I'm Erin Deliosa. Welcome to an Immigrant's Life podcast, my podcast about immigrants and immigration and everything in between. Thank you for listening and downloading the show, and thank you for supporting my dad. Welcome back, Immigrant Nation. Another week, another new episode. Immigrant Nation, before anything else, I'd like to share an exciting news to you all. My hermano, Franklin Rodriguez, host of the Spanglish Hour at 97.9 FM Chin Radio, Ottawa, have lost his mind and nominated me for the Canadian Ethnic Media Association's 44th Annual Awards for Journalistic Excellence in the Best Podcast category. And for some reason, SEMA decided to grant the award for the Best Podcast category to an immigrant's life. Yup, your boy is now an award-winning podcaster. Look at me, ma! Top of the world! <laughs> so, for anyone of you who'd want to watch the web gala and see my beautiful face, you'll be able to watch the award ceremony on SEMA's website at www.canadianethnicmedia.com. It will air this Thursday, November 17 at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I will include the link at the bottom of this episode just in case if you want it. So, yeah, I'm really grateful for this opportunity, and it's nice to get props for the work we are doing here. And of course, I'm grateful to you, my listeners, the Immigrant Nation. Without you, this podcast will not mean anything. Also, a special shout out to Mateo, my young listener. Thank you for the fun art that you made, which you guys would have seen if you follow me on my social media at An Immigrant's Life. Mateo made a sweet and beautiful fan art greeting us for our second anniversary. Again, thank you, Mateo. I really appreciate you. Now, get back to your schoolwork. Anywho, enough with the sentimentality, and let's talk about the episode. Sometimes, we have to go through incredible pain so the beauty in us may surface. Just like what happened to our guest this week. Tearing his patel tendon became the resurrection of his love for creating art and focusing on what really matters to him. This episode is like a breath of fresh air because the guest and I talk so much about the topics that I love talking about. And I hope you like them too. Let's cut to the chase. Without further ado, let's get into the show. Isa, dalawa, tatlo. Today's guest is a comic book portrait artist that draws like Neil Adams and looks like the Filipino Ryan Gosling. (laughs) <laughs> the Brush Stroke Bandit. Everyone, please welcome Jet Labrador. Hey, man. Happy to be here. Wow, wow what an intro. That's the best intro I ever had. <laughs> oh, I appreciate it. it <laughs> I take pride on the intros. It was good. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I, I always like, it's my thing. It's real. Keep going, man. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. First of all, before we get into, thank you for coming on the podcast. I really do appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a good time. Definitely, man. And before we get into too deep, why don't you tell the immigrant nation where they can reach you or if you want to promote anything? Sure. So for right now, uh, I'm on Instagram at the Jet Lab, T-H-E-J-E-T-L-A-B. And on my website, jetlabrador.com. They both have my work. There's a little bio about myself on um, uh, my website. And I have an Etsy that's also at the Jet Lab. So they can reach me there. Mm-hmm. I love your artwork, man. We'll talk more Thank about you. your artwork later. Great. But the first question I want to ask, who's your basketball goat? No brainer, man. Kobe. <laughs> this guy, I knew you were going to say Kobe. Of course, because he's a goat. That's why you knew. <laughs> why do you think he's better than Jordan? All right, here, here, here's the thing. Um, growing up, I was a Jordan guy. My dad's a Jordan guy. You know, um, I was born in 88, so in the 90s, as a kid, I was, I was watching Jordan, mm-hmm. right? But then, like, um, what stood out for me with Kobe is just, like, his work ethic. Like, Jordan, Jordan is, is the GOAT, but Kobe is, is my personal mm. Only because, like, his work ethic and in his mind and the way he, like, pursues anything he wants. Like, after he, you know, he won all his championships and all his accolades in the NBA, this guy went and got an Oscar after retirement. Mm-hmm. A lot of the times the NBA players don't really do anything after playing basketball, you know, but he, he's, he's just very passionate and focused and confident and he's a family guy. You know, he, he, he doesn't mess around. He, he, 
in the NBA, he's, he's very serious. He really likes to party. He was just all about, you know, his craft and his work. And like, I, th- I thought that was admirable, you know? And so in, in that way, um, cause Jordan statistically and like accomplishment wise, you know, uh, surpasses Kobe, mm-hmm. but as like, uh, an individual human being, uh, that's why like Kobe is my, is my guy. hundred percent. I agree. However, I have to be honest. I hated Kobe when he was playing. Uh, hated Kobe because I don't like the Lakers. What's your team? I don't really have a necessary team. Obviously, growing up, uh, the Jordan era, right? Yeah. Everyone, you know, Chicago Bulls. After that, I kind of like bounce around. I like Dirk Nowitzki for a little bit, Steve Nash a little bit, like different players, you know. But I, after that, I can't, I didn't really have a team anymore, you know. Mm-hmm. But going back to Kobe, um, yeah, I hated him. I was like, this arrogant prick, this and that, whatever. And then I watched that documentary, The Muse of Kobe Bryant. I love that documentary. Yeah, it's great. I don't know why is this not available anywhere. It, it, they, they don't market it that well, you know. It was it was on show it was on Showtime, and now you could get it uh, like you rent it on Prime, but it wasn't really marketed that well. I don't know why. I think I think it came out during like the Golden State LeBron era. You, you think know? so? so like, yeah. I, yeah, a while back when he was like re- retired or about to be retired, it didn't really get a lot of attention. Like Kobe fans knew about it, but you know. Yeah, but the thing is, that's what made me a Kobe fan. Yeah. I still hate Kobe. By the way, if I see highlights <laughs> of him, I'm like, fuck yeah. this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if it's like the Kobe off the court, like that's my boy right there. That's my boy right, right there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was he was super cocky, you know, early in his career, like the Lakers, like early Lakers with Shaq and as a rookie, he was like so cocky. But mm-hmm. then as a kid, I don't know why I like that. You know what I mean? He's like, this guy like overly believed in himself. But then like he, he comp- accomplished what he wanted to do too. So like he was able to back it up. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, no, 100%. Like I said, the mama mentality, it's my thing. Like I also love what he said that what's the difference between you and Jordan? He said that, or no, sorry, it, it wasn't him. It was Phil Jackson who actually said that. There are two different main differences between the two. Michael Jordan, he has to be great at everything. He has to beat you at everything. Kobe, he'll only beat you at things that he's good at. Mm-hmm. And I yeah. love that. Like, yeah, focus on one thing, like uh, things that you're good at. So you can control that craziness. I'm sure you saw the last dance. It was just like Jordan was like playing against like whatever like a coin toss you know what i mean it's with security guards right and yeah yeah like he, he just gambled with whoever's there you know so and that that, that that was him i think kobe said that too and i don't know if he said it in the news he said like jordan would gamble with you or like be competitive over, over whatever's there you know golf like kobe's like i don't play golf man like <laughs> <laughs> yeah nonsense you know mm-hmm. but yeah the, the muse of kobe bryant that really changed everything for me since then and like that's my dude right there and Absolutely. I don't know if you felt this way, but I did. I'm going to be honest, but when he passed away, dude, I cried. I was devastated, man. I, I, was, in a, I was in a Chinese restaurant with, with my boys. Hmm. And then like a bunch of my friends were texting me. He's like, Kobe, uh, Kobe, died, Kobe died. I'm like, I thought it was one of those hoaxes. You know how mm-hmm. they have like hoaxes for like random celebrities. Mm-hmm. And then my boy who I was having lunch with, he's like, Kobe died. I'm like, who's Kobe? Who's who's <laughs> like? I thought it was like a friend of his or somebody named Cody. And then everyone started calling me and I'm like, oh shit. And then like, we couldn't even finish eating. We just like left our food. We paid. I went home. Mm. I, I put on mute. I put on Muse that night. Hmm. I was crying all day and I put on Muse. Yeah. It was so crazy. Cause I like, I have had like famous people that, you know, affected me personally and, you know, inspired me personally. He's the only one that like got me like crying, dude. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was, it, but obviously, it didn't help that you know he passed away with his uh, with young uh, daughter there. That didn't help, you know. Yeah, the whole thing was just like super tragic and devastating for like a lot of people, you know. So definitely. Anyways, rest in peace, Kobe. Always, yeah. always, forever. Yep. All time starting lineup. Oh man, this is tough. I'm gonna have to go. Magic at point. Kobe shooting guard. I wonder if I could put Jordan as a small forward and LeBron as power. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can do. Like especially the basketball now, there's no position. Yeah, you know? small ball and and then probably Shaq center. 
Oh man, we are almost the same. I'm a new era guy, you know, so I can tell. Yeah, yeah. Almost the same. I think the only one that I'm gonna change LeBron. Who's a power forward? You're gonna laugh at me. <laughs> Larry Bird. A power forward or a small forward? Power forward, small forward. Doesn't really yeah. matter. Yeah. Now, Larry, Larry could score. Yeah. Well, was, I, I, I love before, Larry Bird. It was before my time, but I've seen a lot of highlights and, and like, you know, and his greatest games and that dude could score. Yeah, he could score <laughs> he in tough. mental game, mental, uh, mental capacity. I love that. I don't know. I'm not there. I'm not there with LeBron yet, even though he is one of the greatest, to be honest. He's... I'm not. I'm not a LeBron fan at all. I, I I hate how people are like LeBron's better than Jordan. I'm like, you forget Kobe existed. <laughs> you know, like, like Kobe, like this guy, like yeah. statistics great, but you know, he doesn't have the killer instincts. And, yeah, know, he, he needs a lot of talent around him all the time. Yeah, and, I there, there was a interview with um, what's his name, Al Harrison. Oh no, Al Harrington. Al Harrington. Yeah, yeah. So he was asked, like, who's your goal? And he says, it's, it's Jordan. And he says, why? Because Jordan dominated when everyone hates each other. LeBron dominated when everyone's friendly with each other. True. You know, it was a great point. But obviously, for me, top three greatest for me is Jordan, Kobe, and LeBron. But he's not on my lineup. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I get it. Yeah. Anyways, let's focus on you. Born in New York, which part of New York did you grow up in? Uh, Astoria, most of my life. I'm, I'm here now. I was born in Manhattan. Mm. But most of my life I've been in Queens, Astoria. Mm -hmm. uh, but my childhood there, I think from like two to four, somewhere around there, I, I lived in the Philippines for a bit. Oh, you live in the Philippines? Yeah, for a couple of years. What age? Like two to four, around there. And then Why? I, came back, I came back here for kindergarten. At the time, my parents split. And then, so my mom stayed here to work, and then my, I went back home with my dad. I lived with him for a little bit over there. Mm -hmm. Which part? Uh, Manila, Tondo. Mm. The hood. Yeah, lugar, yeah, lugar no matatapang. That's what I hear. <laughs> That's what it is. No, well, because they're famous for it. The, they're the one who started the Katipunan. Oh, really? I, I don't know a lot about it. My, my parents would tell me stories, like, from, you know. What they experienced, but I don't know the, the the history. But I'll look into it. Oh, it's rough there. <laughs> yeah, that's what I hear. I avoid it there. You know, I did, I didn't <laughs> grow up close by, but I, I like I don't I don't like Manila. Uh -huh. I never enjoy it because it, you know it's crime. Crowded. You know, crowded. There's pollution. Where are you from? I'm from Rizal, which is like okay. south of Manila. Maybe like without traffic, I'll say about two hours. Oh, okay. Traffic probably like a day. <laughs> 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 you know how it is, you know? That's right, yeah. Have you been back? I, I haven't in like over a decade since I was mm. like a teenager. I'm in my 30s now and I haven't since I was a teenager. Uh, but I'm, I'm going next year mm. in the springtime. By yourself? Uh, with my family. Oh, Mom, that's... dad, brother. That's amazing, man. Reunion. Yeah, yeah. I think there is a reunion too, yeah. No, oh, that's awesome, man. Enjoy it. Thank it's, you. I was actually watching something today, and it was shot in the Philippines. I'm like, I I went back back in 2019, but I'm like, man, I want to go back again. Yeah, that's what yeah, that's what my friends tell me. Like, you, you don't want to leave, or they spend a long time there. They'll be there for like a month. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we talk about basketball because I know you play basketball a lot. Who pushed you to play basketball, dad, or it was just because of the culture? So growing up, I, I didn't really play. I was on teams, but I, I didn't really like it. Mm. And then uh, really, my dad pretty much made me play, and I wanted to play because of my dad. He he mm. played. Uh, he he was in. Uh, he played for Mapua in the Philippines. Nice. He played for a couple of years, and then I think he played amateur also. And then, um, so he was always playing, but then I, I wasn't serious about it until high school. Mm. And then, then I was playing all the time. I was, my dad was training me. I played in high school, a little bit in college, and then, you know, all the inner cities and all the tournaments and stuff. And mm. and then, um, yeah, basketball was my life for a while until, like, my early 20s when I broke my knee. Mm. I broke my knee, and then I was out for, like, for a few months. Like maybe, like, four or five months. I couldn't even walk. It was, it was, it was pretty, I ruptured my patella tendon. So my tendon just came off my kneecap. 
So they had to like sew it back on. I'm in a straight cast for like a few months. So I'm like bedridden Ooh. pretty much. Yeah, it sucks. It sucks. It was the worst. And but in that time, uh, I was watching a lot of movies, and then I I, I started drawing, painting more. Mm. And I think that's what like uh, started, you know, that that passion up again. Okay. What happened at that instant when you right through the Patel? Do you was it a jump? Was it just walking? Uh, it was no. It was in a um. It was in a game, hmm. and uh, it was a, a tournament in Queens. I remember I was in a fast break, and that guy was coming up behind me, and then like I I, I just jumped up with like uh with both my legs. Hmm. My one one of my legs like jumped, the other one just snapped, <laughs> and it was like it was like that. It was like boom, and then like a quick a sharp pain. It didn't hurt that much, and then I'm on the ground, right? Hmm. And I'm like, oh, I'm, I must have just like tripped or I'm, I'm I cramped. I don't know. So I hmm. tried to get up, and I, I couldn't get up. Ooh. And I see, I see my kneecap is like at my quad. No, my kneecap is at, like at my thigh. <laughs> oh shit! And I'm like, there's something wrong, and, and I couldn't get up. And then I had to get a, I had to get a stretcher and an ambulance to get me out of there. And I had surgery that night. But there's no wrong. pain. It was just numb at that point. Okay. Yeah, there's no pain. It was just numb. I think because it's so, it's so traumatic that the body just, you know, shuts down all the pain for, like for something like that. Wow. Yeah, but, 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 you know, but the surgery after and then recovery and physical therapy, that, that shit hurt like a motherfucker. How so? <laughs> I, was in, I was in pain all the time because basically they sewed the kneecap back on right? mm. onto the tendon. And then I had to be in a straight cast like that. But then each and every week they would push you know, to get my range of motion back. But it's, like, stuck stiff mm. with all the scar tissue built up. Mm. So slowly over time, they had to, like, push my kneecap and stretch my knee, and that was painful. Yeah. yeah. And recovery was, like, six months, six, eight months. Every day, right? Every other day was physical therapy. Mm. Yeah. What gave you the strength to keep on going? I didn't really have a choice, you know? Like, I, I was like bedridden for like a week or so. And then I started slowly walking every day, like small steps, small steps. And then I, I, I knew I was, I was miserable. That, that, that was painful. I, I you know, the only, the only thing I loved at the time was basketball. Hmm. And like being away from that and then even being away from my friends, like socially. Like I was just stuck at home. It felt like jail, hmm. you know. So I'm like, right, I need to get back to my life. I need to like speed up the, the rehab process. And then... I need to play again and then but it, it was a blessing in disguise because like i said i found art that way mm -hmm. definitely I, or i rediscovered art you know what was the highest level of basketball did you attain i played a little in high school no i didn't play, I didn't play for the college team but i played like i played the, the leagues there and then i played intercity and then we you know we play each other in you know like state to state so that'd be the highest level mm -hmm. like like 22 and under like 25 under like around there like around around that time i played with like the highest competition like in the, the tri-state area in um interstate teams and in the state mm -hmm. like i go to florida chicago what position do you play i was like shooting guard okay i know mm -hmm. i like to pass <laughs> <laughs> they make me point guard but then you know i i just like drift off to the perimeter it's not your and, thing yeah, but then I, I got used to it too because like the, I, I played in my later twenties and I, I'd I'd still be point, you know. But I I'd be like a hybrid, you know. I'd bring mm -hmm. the ball up, but once in a while I I need to shoot. <laughs> <laughs> We're reverse then. I always like passing. Oh really? Yeah, it's I, my I like thing. Doing, I like doing fancy passes and stuff <laughs> like that. You know? I know. I I'm lazy, you know. Like I I want someone that like that are a good scorer. Because mm -hmm. I, I know if I have a good score, I could just pass the ball to him and let him do his job. Oh, like when you wait for somebody to make a cut or something like that, and then you know. Yeah, or if there's a shooter in the corner, just pop the mm -hmm. shoot, pop it over there, and I, yeah, all I have yeah. to do is just stand there and just be cute. And then yeah, I'll... You're, like, you're, like, you're like the perfect teammate. <laughs> I and like then to you're think back so. On defense. Uh, yeah, yeah I like I like to think <laughs> so. I'm, I I love defense too. So it's just it's just easier, you know. I I I can score if I want to. But if there's someone that can do the job, hey, go do your thing. You're, you're more of a team player, yeah. <laughs> and you're not? I used to not be. I used to just, like, <laughs> shoot all the time. I had to, like, learn to be, you know. Like, co coaches would bench me because I'd, like, go over a lot. But No way. What changed? 
I realized like it, for me to get the ball, I have to pass it. <laughs> <laughs> for, for your teammates and your coaches to trust you, you got to like trust them too, you know? Yeah. They, I had a coach when I was younger that he told me to get more shots, you need to pass the ball. Because once you pass the ball and that ball can, comes back to you, you have the right to shoot that. Yeah. And, and then you want your other teammate, teammates, we want everybody to be a threat, you know? Mm -hmm. so it opens a lot of people up. 100%. So describe your mental health during the recovery. Did you suffer from maybe a little bit of depression? Yeah, I was pretty depressed. I remember I was pretty depressed. And I, I feel like I was, I was more angry too. I, I would lash out at my parents and they're just, you know, at home trying to help me. And, and I, I was just impatient. And I remember them telling me like, you know what your problem is? You, you're impatient. But, but I remember like, it, it just, like I said, it just felt like hell. It felt like I'd be there forever. Hmm. But then, you know, they, they, they live longer than me and, or more wise than me. I, I'm, I'm, I've been impatient like a lot of my life. And I always want to get to the next thing, you know. Hmm. So, like, I, I guess that was another, another lesson I had to learn. But I, I, I think just like thinking in that time mindset, not like enjoying whatever present you have, hmm. trying to get to the, the future or the next thing, that, that's what makes people depressed or anxious, I think. And like that, that was my problem at the time. I actually picked up med meditation during the, like I, I was never spiritual, but then I, I got more spiritual during that experience. I meditated, I, I'd meditate on like healing and stuff like that. Hmm. Who told you about meditation and what made you decide to, to pick up meditation? I don't remember. I, I think I just like, I've read a couple books on it, like, like uh, new agey spiritual books. Like uh, Brian Wise, he talks about reincarnation and maybe like Eckhart Tolle. He's hmm. like, uh, he wrote The Power of Now. And I was never into it, but I decided to try it out one day. And I, I listened to like this guided meditation on YouTube. And uh, it, there's a countdown and then you fall asleep. Or, or no, you, you, it's supposed to relax you when you count down. So it's like 10 and then 3, 2, 1. And I, I just remember I kind of fell asleep, but I felt like I woke up. It was in my chair, and all of a sudden, I felt like like the room I was in was full of all white light. It's gonna mm -hmm. get a little weird. I felt like everything around me was white light, and then I'm looking around like, I was like, did I just fall asleep? Like I'm I'm looking around, and then like it, it scared me because like I never had an experience like that before, and 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 then like the next it, like it scared me so much I, I woke up, <laughs> and and then I, and then I'm back in my chair. I'm like, what the hell was that? And it, it and it was it was nice, and I felt super relaxed after. And I was like, oh, shit, is that why people meditate to experience stuff like that? But then I, I've, I've never gotten to that point ever again. It happened once. Once and that's it. I, I, I meditate to this day and it, it's super, it's really helpful mm -hmm. for like awareness and being present and being still. But um, I, I never experienced something like that ever again. <laughs> <laughs> it was weird, man. Yeah. I can imagine. Meditation, what's your process? Do you... Do it in the morning, in the afternoon? Do you go in a room? How do you do it? Usually in the morning, I'll, first of all, like first thing in the morning, I walk my dog and then I come back. And then uh, right, right before work, uh, um, right before I clock into work, I just like sit there and I'll either do by myself, it's 10 minutes. You just like follow your breathing. Mm -hmm. And then you're, you're going to think a bunch of thoughts. And uh, the goal is to just like let go of your thoughts and not try to follow it or like get overrun by it. Mm. And then you just try to bring it back to your breathing and concentrate on that. Either I use a timer on my phone or I use um, the app Headspace. Mm. It's a really good app. They like guide you through, you know, like follow your breathing and then like let go of your thoughts. And yeah, it's really good. I, I feel like it's really helpful for me. Mm -hmm. I do meditation too in the morning. Oh, yeah? But I don't do, I don't follow the app because the app is annoying when they go <laughs> like, you know what I mean? When they go like, you know, yeah. You know, like, it's time to breathe now. Like, shut up. Bro, <laughs> let me do my thing, bro. Yeah, sometimes they'll talk too much, yeah. So what I do is I do a prayer. Okay. And from through the prayer, I found, like, a, a rhythm through where I can say the prayer, like, a, a sentence, and then I'll breathe through that, between that. Oh, great, yeah. You know, and like, like you said there, like, you know, before when meditation came out, it was like the idea was like, empty your mind. You don't actually empty your mind. It's not no. possible. Yeah, yeah. It's, I think it's a misconception. People think like, oh, I, I can't stop thinking. Like no one stops thinking. 
you know like i think that that's the point like you, you're supposed to just be aware of your thinking and then leave it at that and you try to be still and that's it yeah for me my process is when if a thought comes in if it's a negative positive whatever thought it is it'll come in and then it stays and then goes out and on to the next one on to the next right. one but yeah meditation is amazing great that's good to know mm -hmm. definitely um I don't I know a lot of people that does it, but hey, I do it. Practice. I don't really like to tell people, you know? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, right. I'll tell people uh, if they ask, like if they're going through something and they're like, hey, what can I do? And besides eating right and going to the gym, like you try meditation, <laughs> or, you know? Well, you just gave three things that's so hard to do. <laughs> it's not, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's simple, but it's not, it's not easy, right? Yeah, well, the, the thing is, it's easy. It is simple, but no one wants to do it. Because food tastes too good, and then, like, it takes a lot of effort to get to the gym, and, yeah. But and you really... You a lazy lifestyle now, too, you know? Yeah, you know, like, everything's, like, on the touch of the phone. It's just, like, it's here. Uber app. Uber, every Prime, Uber app. Amazon you know? Prime, yeah. Mm, exactly. But, I mean, I enjoy working out. Do you work, enjoy working out? Yeah. Yeah, I do work. I work out a few days a week. Mm -hmm. Do you lift weights or cardio? Um, I get pretty bored. Uh, so I, I lift or I do calisthenics hmm. or, I, or I run. But uh, I probably do cardio the least. <laughs> I, 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 like, I like lifting and, and um, calisthenics and playing, playing basketball. Yeah, well, that's cardio. Yeah, but that's the only time I, I run a lot, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I I, <laughs> yeah definitely i do for cardio i do um i go i cycle oh nice oh i've done i've done some like spin classes those are fun oh no no not that like outside oh yeah yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. One, yeah that's one too yeah so i'll go for 100 kilometers every you know like every weekend or whatever oh wow do you go like uphill and stuff like that yeah yeah wow yeah 100 kilometers yeah, the the longest I've done was one seventy two. Oh wow! Kilometers, by the way, not miles. Do you know how much that is in miles? Okay, miles. It's how much, it's like yeah, how many? It's yeah. like you like it's. I think it's like one and a half. One kilometer is equals to one mile, something like. Okay. Bro, I'm not good in math. Don't put me in the spot like this. No, so it's like two hundred, two hundred plus, like two hundred miles, or, or like. No, no, no. Because I know one hundred miles is equals to one hundred sixty two kilometers. Oh, okay, so close to a hundred, closer, closer to a hundred, over the over a hundred miles. Yeah, exactly. I know lot. this because when I got into biking, I told my friend, I said, "Yo, I'm like, you know, I've gone into biking." And he's like, "Have you done um, a century ride?" I was like, "What do you mean, like one hundred? I'm like, "Yo, I do that every weekend, bro." <laughs> and he's like, "No, no, no, no. Like a century ride is like hundred miles." I'm like, "What?" I said, "We're Canadians. We don't do miles." But yeah. it's like, yeah, but the century is like, okay. So that like put a challenge in my brain. Like I have to do it. So I did it. That's great. Wow. That's oh, trust great. me. What, it, kind of, it, what kind of bike do you have? Oh, I have a giant contender. Nothing, nothing fancy. Is that for like long distance? Yeah. For only wow. long distance. Yeah. I mean, but trust me, your ass is going to be like on fire. Yeah. 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 That, no matter what kind of seat you got. <laughs> exactly. But Talking about meditation, cycling for me is meditation. Oh, definitely, yeah, because you're you're focused right here, you know. Mm -hmm. Especially when like in farmlands, you know, there's not there's no cars, no oh, nothing, wow. and you just like. Yeah, nature will make you present too. Hmm. Because you know? like in the city, there's almost distractions and you know cars and people, but, but then like in that setting, it's nice. You're you're just pedaling and you know. Yeah, definitely. Go back to you a little bit. When you were bedridden for a couple of months. It gave you perspective in life. What kind of perspective did it give you? Kind of, first of all, like off the bat, like I'm, I'm not immortal. I, I can't just like push my body as hard as I can to do something. And, and also like I, I need to prioritize my time more. Hmm. And then what matters to me, like I think I made my, my life basketball a little too much. And so I realized I, I could spend more time with like family and friends and even look into other things that I can enjoy if like my body broke down, you know, like, like art, mm -hmm. you know? So like b being on timeout like that, like definitely put, puts things into perspective and you enjoy things more 
like after you recover like you, you enjoy being out with your friends and you don't take it for granted and you, you you enjoy basketball more too because you haven't played in a long time but then you play smarter mm. like I, I i drive a lot I, I used to drive a lot and, and and jump a lot but then like i picked up you know a jump shot and, and passing <laughs> <laughs> you know but so i had a more all-around game after that and i actually mm. played like better i i it happened to me when i was like 22 mm. and so like after that yeah you know you, it just gives you perspective on like a lot of things and yeah prior prioritization in your life gave you wisdom definitely yeah mm-hmm. you said you read a lot i know you read one of my favorite books actually war of art that's a great book great book that's yeah, one of my favorites What did you learn from it? The main thing is that whatever you want to do, whatever like passion or craft that you have, that you're going to feel resistance mm-hmm. in like even relationships, your job, like anything, anything you want to do that requires action, you're going to feel resistance. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that's like what separates people who are great at something and people who just like pick something up and it gets hard and they drop it is because they feel that initial resistance and it's tough in the beginning. But then mm-hmm. they don't they don't realize like once you just keep at it whatever your thing is you you break through that resistance and you just re- reach plateaus and different levels of you know skill or like mastery mm-hmm. like that that's the biggest thing I took away from War of Art. Mm-hmm. I love that book. I Great book, man. Book. I still I still revisit. I think I I read it like a couple weeks ago. <laughs> really? So you just pick it up you pick it up and then whatever page is on it's gonna tell you something good. Mm. I don't reread books honestly. You should. Yeah, I should. Yeah. I tell that to myself all the time because, like, I have favorite books that I'm like, man, I remember that book when I was reading it. It was so good. Why wouldn't I read it again? I don't know why. I used to not, and then a, fr- a friend told me to do it. And like, uh, in, in 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 recent years, I started rereading books, and like, you have a different perspective now. Hmm. You know, like, like, and then it starts connecting things to your, it, like, you pick up things that'll apply for your to your life now. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then like you'll catch things that you didn't really understand when you're like younger mm-hmm. and then like it also reinforces like lessons you already know and you know yeah so that's why I, i reread a lot of books yeah 100 i agree with that is for me it was um the movie the godfather oh yeah, yeah. so i watched that when i was like elementary and for me it was like a you know whatever like shooting and whatever else right mm-hmm. i saw it in high school I saw it in college. I saw it like uh, just past college, and I saw it now. And it's every time I see it, there's a different thing that I see or learn that I never seen before. Right? Yeah, the same same thing with books. Books takes more effort, though. <laughs> yeah, I think that's why. Because yeah, I love yeah, reading, yeah. so uh, there's so much books to read. I'm like, okay, after this, I'm gonna read this one. Definitely, you should. What else book do you think is a must read? Um. I have a couple, but off the top of my head, uh, probably Power of Now, what I mentioned earlier, Eckhart Tolle. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically, this guy was like anxious all his life. He, he was a young man at the time, and he had like a nervous breakdown. And then like, I think he was suicidal, and he, he was saying, uh, I can't live with myself anymore. And then and then once he's had that thought, he's like, I can't live with myself. It's like, then then if I can't live with this part of myself, then what what am I? And all of a sudden, his brain did whatever to him, and it, it just put put him in the present moment, like super hard. So, like after that experience, his like nervous breakdown, he was just like very present for the next like six months to a year or something like that. Hmm. And then he wrote his book, and like he realized like everything everyone is searching for is in the present moment. Like everyone is after things like in the future, but they're really seeking a feeling that they could feel right now. In the mm-hmm. moment, like uh, people play sports and experience all these things. They drink alcohol, smoke weed, have sex, whatever it is they're trying to experience is, is they're just trying to feel like an intense presence. Mm-hmm. And even like things like adrenaline junkies, they'll like jump out of planes or, you know, you know, ski mountains because they're trying to feel present. Mm-hmm. And that's like uh, it, it's helped me to this day. And I, I read that over like 10 years ago. Wow. Beautiful. Speaking of being present, you mentioned on your website that art gives you that. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, like what I was mentioning before about like activities that keep you present, like art is one of those things. It used to be basketball. 
And then like, you know, I, I've taken so many breaks from that and I'm focusing more on art and like when I'm making whatever it is I'm making, like it, it just kind of, you have to be present to accomplish whatever it is you want to accomplish on canvas or the computer or whatever. Mm. You have a reference or you're just drawing from your mind, but your, your, your thoughts quiet down, doesn't completely stop. It quiets down and then you're just in this state where you're just creating, it's fun, you're enjoying yourself and your mind's quiet. And all of a sudden you have something like you think looks really nice. And then what's even awesome, like better than that is that you, you get to share it with people. And if people want it for themselves, if they enjoy it, then that's great too. So now mm-hmm. everyone's enjoying like a, a piece of activity that you just did because you're present, you know? And I feel like people do their best work when they're present. 100%, definitely. What's your creating process? Usually, um, with whatever piece, um, uh, it's like I'm, I'm inspired by like a movie or a character. And then I, I gather a bunch of references, like pictures or like, I don't know, quotes, songs. And I have like kind of like a reference board on my computer and mm-hmm. I'll just look through. And then I also look at, you know, I'll think of angles or shapes and ideas for the piece I want to make. And I'm just focusing on my references for a while, probably a couple of days before I even start painting. And mm. then one, once I have like a better idea in my mind, I just start sketching. I'll sketch, you know, like on my iPad or my computer. Um, these days it's digital. Mm. So I start sketching and then uh, I'm just looking at the reference, my references and, my, you know, what inspires me. And I just go from there. Mm. You mainly paint portraits of comic book characters. Why did you choose that subject? Um, I've always loved superhero movies and action movies and sci-fi movies growing up. Like I watched like Star Wars, Power Rangers, X-Men animated, Batman animated growing up. Like th- that was my thing, you know? And then like, I, I, in, I remember I, like, I loved to draw them as a kid, like pencil markers. And then uh, my dad drew, he studied architecture um, in college. And so he would draw a lot. And I thought it was like the coolest thing, you know? So like I asked him, hey, in the beginning, I was like, hey, can you draw this? Can you draw this? And like it bothered him all the time. <laughs> and so one day he's like, you, you draw it. I'm like, all right, fine. But, you, you know, so I like asked him to teach me how to draw. And I thought I just thought him doing it was like so cool because like the way he draw it looked super realistic. I'm like, oh, I want to be able to do that. At like four or five years old, I wanted to do that, you know. Hmm. So um, it stemmed from like my dad drawing these characters. And then like that's what I grew up on. And it, it, it's pretty crazy how like comic books in the superhero world like blew up in the last like 10 years because mm-hmm. you know in the 90s it was like a like a nerdy thing to be <laughs> into and now it's like the mainstream thing in like hollywood and stuff mm-hmm. and I, I still enjoy today because like I'm, i'm still getting inspiration from all the you know like the hit movies which are usually sci-fi or superhero films mm-hmm, definitely oh i'm gonna give props to you with your uh, the mandalorian piece man that is prime Oh, thank you. I'm going to send you one. Oh, thank you. Well, appreciate yeah. that, man. I love that piece. Thank your you. piece, are, I love your art, obviously. I love, I even like the Pikachu Flash mashup. Oh, up. thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I love I'll that. send you a sticker of that, too. Yeah. Oh, thank you, man. But I don't know why, but that Mandalorian one gets me like, this is this is the shit right here. I appreciate it. A lot of, pe- a lot of people say that about it. You know, it's funny because like, I didn't think it was that great. <laughs> I, 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 I like how it's like, it, it's very him. And mm. like, it, it, it's all like, um, it, it's like, it has a tone and it's grayish throughout because he's on whatever ship he's on and it matches his suit. And there's some sparks, you know, like, I didn't think it was like a standout piece, but then like a lot of people like it. So like, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah, I love that piece, man. When I like, I was browsing through your website and your work. I'm like, I kept on coming back to that. I'm like, yo, this one's the shit right here, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna note that to, to mm. see what made it work. You know. Yeah. How long did it take you to make that one? That one, and most of them don't take long, like three to five, three to six hours, but but it's not in one sitting. I do like an hour here, two hours there, half an hour here, hmm. you know, but not, not long. I mean, yeah, maybe like, yeah, three, three, six hours, I'd say each of them. But that one, that one wasn't long. Uh, that was probably closer to three or four. 
I love that you said that it, you didn't think it was that good. And if most of the people, creative people that I talk to when I say like, or as people say to me too, because, you know, I like to think I'm creative too, that, oh, I didn't even think about that. Like, I thought it was just like, whatever, you know, a throwaway. And it was actually the shit, you know? Yeah, because like, I don't know, I guess like you have your own favorites while you're creating whatever it is, you know? So you're focused on those things or, or you try really hard at one th- uh, this one project. And it's like, oh, this has to be good because I tried really hard, right? <laughs> but then the one that was that took less effort is the one like people enjoy more. Maybe like people can sense that. Maybe maybe it translates. Like if it was easy, if you're in a flow state, you know, if you're very present with the project, then maybe people can tell, and that's why they like it. You know? Yeah, you were just in a flow. You were present. Yeah. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. I I I think so. I I think so. I think that makes sense. Do you think digital art will ever replace physical painting? So I started with um, traditional art first, like oil paintings and pencil drawings. And I was intimidated by digital because it was just a new media I had to learn. Mm-hmm. And it was like difficult to learn. It took me like a couple of months. But I, I don't. But now I see it as two different things. I don't see that like really as the same, like painting under an umbrella of like painting. And then you have digital and and uh traditional i think it's like two separate entities mm-hmm. because the thing are you can accomplish a lot in digital like there's so many different effects like lighting effects that you know things that glow and filters and and, and you can pretty much do anything in digital to make something look realistic mm. in, in less time on a canvas but when you see a painting in canvas and it's really good and it's like a lot of effort and it's ex- like expressionist and you see the brush strokes and and you could see that it took a lot of effort for it to accomplish like what it's trying to set out to, like the the lighting and the uh, composition of it. Mm. You kind of appreciate it more than a digital painting, mm. because you could physically see, you know, like the painting and the the paint and the strokes and you know the expression in it. Mm-hmm. But a digital time. painting, like a, a digital painting, can be beautiful, but it's just kind of just it's flat, you know. Yeah, I I, I see that. Have you made an NFT? No, I've like looked into it, but I feel like I've I've had so many projects, and I was about to where it just fell through because like I wasn't really passionate enough for it. Mm. I'm not too big into crypto. Like I, I've you know invested, but then like the market crash re- recently like killed me and a lot of people. And then like yeah, I don't know, it just it just seemed it also seemed like you you need a massive following for people to bid on your thing. Mm. And to, to to buy your NFTs for it to to make a lot of money, mm. so I don't have a, a that large of a following yet to have the traction to get a lot of people to bid, and people with a lot of money. Mm, definitely. You know? Who are the artists that you try to emulate? Growing up, it was my dad, mm. and then he really like you know like awoken like my you know passion for art. But these days, like Jim Lee, he's a big one. He's like ahead of DC. Hmm. Jim Lee, who else? Alex Ross is a really good comic book artist. He yeah, I like, like him. Yeah, he he started like a lot of the realism in, in paintings and stuff. And um, the newer guys, probably like uh, Ryan Minerding, he's like a head visual developer at um, Marvel. Mm, I don't know that one. Yeah. Yeah, I'll send them to you. Basically, like a lot of the guys, like Andy Park and stuff, they they, they paint beautifully. Like they it's they do a lot of digital, but if you see their work, it, it looks traditional. Mm-hmm. They make it look like paintings. Like you see the brush strokes and stuff. Really? Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, I'll send them to you. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I I collected some comic books and um, what do you call this? Um, you know, you know when they collect the comic book and then become a book. I forgot the word. Jesus Christ. Um, you know, in a book, it's oh, oh uh, like like art books, like no, no, it's this collection of the the comic oh, books, a graphic novel, graphic novel. Jesus Christ, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, graphic yeah, yeah. novel. Yeah, I collect yeah. that, and um, I love. I have one that was done by what's his name, Ad Adams. I think it's Adams' last name. It was the Joker. Neil Adams. 
I think it's Neil. I, I think it's Neil. I'll I'll send it to you. But it's just like the, the drawing is just beautiful. It's such a short story of uh, the Joker, and it's just the painting is just gorgeous, man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some people really know how to like express whatever story they're tr you know they're trying to tell in like one picture, and I think that's you know that's the idea. Mm. You sell your painting and your artwork. How do you know how to price the art? Um, so, so with prints, uh, I, I just found like a sweet spot that people are willing to buy mm. and it's, it's around like 20 to 30, mm -hmm. you know, like around there. And then, um, with commissions, it's a little trickier. Mm. Uh, paintings used to be like 500 to a thousand, mm -hmm. but apparently I was, I was selling a little too low, <laughs> according to some of my friends. <laughs> but, but then it's, it's so like subjective because some people are cheap. Mm. And some people are, are like understand like the effort it takes and are willing to pay that much. Mm -hmm. So it really depends like who's around you, who's your clientele. Yeah, but I speaking of costume, I love the costume things that you do when it's like someone's birthday or someone's gonna get married. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. The, the, those I enjoy a lot, and like they they love it. You know, like it's always so personal to them. It's like somebody's yeah, somebody's birthday or like somebody's. Recently, it was at my friend's wedding, and it was like the the play bill for their wedding because yeah. like they you know they they love plays and like people at the wedding like loved it and they did and like it, it felt really good. Like when I was asked to do it, I didn't think it was that big a deal. I thought it was fun and like he was a friend of mine, so I'm like, oh yeah, I'll help you out with that. This sounds fun. Mm. But then like seeing it you know in person at the wedding, I'm like, oh shit, you know this is something I made and it's a part of you know their day. Yeah, it's well done, man. I love the style. They're wearing the barong and the saya. I love it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. What was your inspiration? Oh, that was that's all them. Mm. They had all the ideas and they just told me, like, oh, I want to wear barong and then she was going to wear this dress and then we want to be around the earth. But then, like, they basically just had an idea mm. and then I just, you know, painted it in my style and, and then I would, you know, set, send them drafts. Like, what do you think of this? Like, oh. You know, change the color of that, and that that that's the fun part when you interact with you know your clients, and then they and they're honest with you because mm -hmm. it helps you like step up your art game and even your communication. You mm -hmm. know, but like that that one was a lot of fun. Yeah, I want to ask you one question or a topic I want to talk to you about: superheroes when they're changing ethnicity. What's your opinion about it? I think it's great. I mean, like for a long time, a lot of them are white. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so it's nice to see representation, like, especially, like, recently. Um, Shang-Chi, obviously. Your, your boy Simu from Canada, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, like seeing him up there and, like, and I read his book and it's crazy to see, like, he had, like, our similar lives. You know, like, he's, like, first generation. His parents were immigrants. And then he came to, they came to Canada and he made this, like, whole life for himself. And he could have went the practical route. And then it's, like, inspiring, you know, like. Because mm. people of your background, your color can achieve great things like that. So, yeah, representation matters in that way, definitely. Mm -hmm. I agree. It's funny when you say representation matters because I was talking to this lady at a party and she's a white woman. And she's like, she, we're talking about the emoji on the phone. You know how you can change the complexion? Mm -hmm. yeah. And she's like, why does it matter? Why, why can't just we use yellow all the time? Oh yeah. Yeah. And I was like, you know, yellow, it's just like, it's yellow. And I said, well, because you have never been in a position that you were never represented. Right, exactly. Like, like she, she is the default. She is the majority. So, like, <laughs> you know, so she always felt welcomed or a part of the main crowd. She's mm -hmm. never felt like an outsider where, you know, like, do I matter? And, then, and that's why we have to represent people in something as simple as emojis, you know, like, got to feel They'll let everyone feel like they're included because that's what the world is about, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she kind of accepted that, but then turns around and say, well, there's a, there's an emoji about a man that is pregnant. I'm like, yo, these are two different things. <laughs> <laughs> like, let's just stick to ethnicities and colors <laughs> for now. Right? Then we'll get to the other conversations later. <laughs> exactly. I see some Jackson Pollock in your art. Are you a big fan? Yeah, yeah. He was an innovator, you know, like mm -hmm. the paint splatter and the expressionistic ways like of, of that. Like it just 
it was groundbreaking at the time, but nobody was doing that. Everything was controlled and he was just taking a bunch of pain and then bang, um, and then like, and then there's something about it, how like natural it looks, you know, when you see paint splash and it's, it's like an explosion. And all, if you're using different colors, you could really see where, you know, the splatters and the drops like fall. And I think, I think when, art is close to nature and how things would look like in real life that that's when they're aesthetically pleasing you know Mm -hmm. and i try to include some of that because it's digital so it's all fake you know (laughs) but i try to include something that looks a little natural in it Mm -hmm. you know i try to introduce art to my kids and i showed pollock one time like they're like what is this dad it's just platters (laughs) (laughs) i'm like i know what you're saying but yeah, there yeah. is no, no, no get it me- when they grow up. <laughs> yeah, there's method to the madness, you know. Right. How old how old are your kids? My eldest, he's in high school, and my youngest is graduating elementary. Oh wow, congrats. Congrats. Uh, thank you, thank you. They're good kids, you know. That's good. They got a good dad. Oh, thank you. I, I think They're so. Pa- I, I'm a passionate guy, so. Um uh, my young my eldest actually just came from basketball practice. Does he like to pass or shoot? He likes passing. Mana. Um, yeah, man, exactly. <laughs> Passing pass defense. My youngest, he uh, likes shooting. <laughs> good. We need somebody to shoot. <laughs> yeah. But I don't pressure them. I don't push them to, like, basketball. Oh, wow, good. They yeah. came along their own. Yeah, like, they see me play, that's it. I don't. I never, like, hey, go outside and do the thing, you know? Like, you know, I know you don't have kids, but, like, they say that, Oh, if you have books around the, the house and you read every day and your kid sees you reading, they will be readers too. It's bullshit. <laughs> I think you could have some kind of environment to like make things like easier accessible like that. But then at the end of the day, they're going to do what they want to do, right? Exactly. Dude, I have tons of books. <laughs> tons. I have like hundreds. Yeah. I have never seen this guy touch my books. Ever. That was funny. <laughs> And I'm like, dude, come on, read a book. They're like, no, dad, I'm playing video game. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'll, I'll cross that bridge when I get there. Yeah, exactly. But it is what it is, you know. When you decided to go back to art, has your life been different since? Absolutely, in, in a lot of ways. Um, so after I broke my knee, I went to nursing school. and then. Um, I took this studio art class because it was a, it was like a, a requirement and then I really enjoyed it. And then like the, me and the professor were clicking really well. Like he really liked what I was doing. I never painted before, but I had to paint in that class. I was doing, I don't, I don't remember like landscapes or something like that. But then my, my final project, we could paint whatever we want. And I, I painted like an Iron Man piece and like a Batman piece. And all like my friends were like, oh my God, it looks amazing. I'm like, really? I'm just trying to pass this class, you know? <laughs> and, and, and then this um and then from then, like people started asking me to paint stuff for them. Hmm. I'm like, okay, for your birthday, I'll do that. And then like I was getting more and more requests. And then it turned and, yeah, and turned and then it was like, all right, I'm, I've been doing this for free. I should really charge now, you know? <laughs> and, then, and then it was like fifty dollars, fifty dollars, you know, for paintings. And then I, that's how I started commissions in college, like while I was going to nursing school. Mm-hmm. And in that way, my life changed because, like, all of a sudden, I had like you know this little side hustle that I didn't mean to have. Uh, I'm a pretty laid back guy, and I'm a pretty social guy. Mm-hmm. I just like to play basketball, like you gotta go to work or go to school, and then like hang out and like and and party and stuff. But then all of a sudden, I had this like new responsibility of these commissions, and in in that way, it's changed my life. Mm-hmm. Like I'm more disciplined and I'm more social in that way. Where I have to, you know. I have to help people out with what, like whatever their projects is, and I don't want to let them down because like they were my friends at first, you know. Mm. And uh, but on a spiritual and like uh, growth level, it, it's helped me a lot. It's it's taught me patience. It's taught me about myself. It's taught me timing. Um, like you can't force anything. Like for a long time, I like I didn't think I was as you know. I I always thought I wasn't that great. And like, there's always a next level to get to, which is true. But then I sh- I learned to like kind of appreciate where I'm at, where I'm at, and mm. accept where I'm at, and that way I can make adjustments and get better. Mm. You know, so in, in yeah, art taught me 
like a lot like with people and, and myself and and just having a, a passion and a craft and so, like something you love it just puts a lot of like focus in your life mm. that's beautiful man do you regret not starting to take painting seriously earlier yeah i think about that all the time <laughs> <laughs> um so, so recently uh i, I started acting mm. so I, i'm taking classes for that I, i've done a couple short films like nothing crazy just like a couple of lines here and there for like my friends who do like uh have small projects and short films and stuff mm. and then um so with that and art i, I wish i i took them both seriously in high school. I kind of like low key wish I ne I never played basketball mm. and and then wish I just ju jumped into art or acting because I I wouldn't know where I'm at now. But that's like a paradox, you know, it's like oh if I, if I knew now then if I knew what I knew now then, you know, but that that's I guess that's just how it is. Yeah, you have to appreciate what you are you are now, right? And because if it wasn't you don't know if maybe if you didn't play basketball at all and you just did your art, maybe you wouldn't appreciate art now as much as you appreciate it now. Totally. And I think, I think um, my, the way I practice art is like similar to the way I, I practice basketball back in the day. Hmm. Like I always had to do two to four hours of basketball every day. Like after school, before school, I'm, I'm always practicing like in my driveway or local gym. I'm like every day. So like, Ever since I, I stopped playing basketball, like I had a new, I had to focus on something else, which is art, and I, I do that for a minimum two hours a day. And mm -hmm. I think that's what got me to where I'm at now. Mm -hmm. Do you draw in the morning more or at night? No, it's it's in the afternoon. The mornings are just too busy. I walk my dog, and then I try to get as much sleep as I can. Walk my dog, and go like clock into work, and then. I draw during work, you know, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> it's an at-home IT job, you know, there's some downtime, so I'll draw during work, but it's mostly in the evenings. I, I always think, like, evening is the best creative moment because I find, like, it's more quieter and the muse yeah. sings louder and the demons screams louder. Definitely. Def yeah, definitely. I, I think, like, you have a lot of energy early in the day. But then you have your job and then like other like the people in your life are awake. So you're they're texting you, or you're emailing. So like you're you're easily distracted. But like you said, the evening it's quieter. But then like you're you're a little bit lower energy, but that might help because you're more relaxed. Mm. But then yeah, the, the demons are louder. <laughs> because it is getting late and now you're getting lazy, you know. Yeah. But this is the only this is the only time of day you have to work on your shit. So you have exactly. to you said you're partially colorblind. Which color you cannot see? It's it's mostly uh, like uh, purples. Mm. So if there's not enough red in a purple, it's blue. It looks blue to me. Mm. How does that impede you from creating art? I feel like if I did it alone, it would it, it would affect it a lot. But I always like hit up my girlfriend or my <laughs> friends like yo. I'll, I'll I'll take a picture of it. I'm like yo, is this purple, bro? It's like yeah, it's kind of blue. And then like I just you know. I love it. Color pickers help a lot in like Photoshop. Because mm. if I just Google a purple and I just color pick that, I'll just grab it and drop it into my painting. Well, you know, technology um, and your friends, technology and your friends can help you with your yeah, so, handicap. That's <laughs> awesome. My youngest is partially colorblind too. Oh, well, what does he see? What does I think it's see? yellow. I think he has a problem with yellow and green. Yellow and green gets tough too. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, I think others have issues with also like, yeah, like maroons and browns, you know, like when Dude, it gets I weird. have problems <laughs> with any color, okay? And I'm not even colorblind. I, yeah, I think like name, like uh, sometimes I, I wonder if I'm really colorblind or I just don't know the name of what I'm seeing. <laughs> 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 yeah. That's just maroon, bro. Like, it's either oh, I have problems with my eyes or I'm just stupid. <laughs> <laughs> or we just don't know the color name, you know? But how did you know that you're colorblind? Because I would paint, like, early in my painting, I would paint stuff, and then, like, people were like, oh, why'd you make that blue and their costume is purple? Like, you know, that, that <laughs> stuff. Like, what are you talking about? It's purple. Like, That's funny. Or somebody would, oh, or I would compliment somebody, or, you know, I would see what they're wearing. Like, That's a nice pink shirt. Like, it's not pink, dude. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. But, like, socially is how I found out. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, quick question. The Pikachu Flash. I'm sure there's like some sort of like copyright or infringement about it. Like, 
and then you're selling it. Is there like a law about that or what? So I get asked this a lot. So basically, fa- like selling fan art is illegal. Like you're not to, allowed to sell copywritten characters in, in in merchandise or anything in any capacity. Mm. But fan art is like a gray area because one, like people who make fan art, they don't make enough money where the big head companies, Disney like and DC, like they're not going to go after guys who make a couple hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars. They're only after people who make a, like a lot of money, mm. you know? And and it also like fan art is also how you practice your craft. And if, if you want exposure to those companies so you can get jobs, so you could be licensed and, and get, get those rights to sell work. So it's like a weird gray area. And then like at, at comic conventions, everybody sells fan art, even if they're licensed or not. Mm. And it's just like the, the culture, it's like, not even frowned upon sometimes it's like it's encouraged because you know that's the stuff that sells at conventions and like i said it like it promotes you to um the industry professionals mm. yeah and it promotes the characters or the products yeah also yeah yeah but if you're making you know like tens of thousands of dollars like you know selling t-shirts like that's illegal you know <laughs> yeah like, wait, 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 wait we want the cat yeah, yeah, yeah. right 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 yeah, yeah exactly is flash your favorite character Flash is one of them. Yeah, like I, I like the I used to like the CW show a lot with mm. Grant Gustin because it was just really well written. Like the first few seasons, but like Batman was always my guy. Batman's a dude. Yeah, because he's just he's just a guy, you know, with a lot of pain and his resources and that's the it. darkness. I love the darkness. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. he kicks ass. Like, <laughs> but however, the Flash is for me is number one. Yeah, yeah, he's a great character. Who's your Flash though, Barry or the other guys? I like I like Wally West. He's he's like he's like a fun version of you know he's he's kind of like childish and silly. Hmm. But then like Grant Gustin, his show like he, he made me really like like Barry Allen a lot. Like his his take of Barry Allen. Barry Allen's the dude, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's like he's the main Flash. It's Barry Allen. Yeah. But Wally West is like fun, you know. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, for def- definitely, yeah. I have the DVD collection of the Flash back in the 90s. Oh, with... Um, I forgot the guy, the dude's name, but I have it. I used to watch it all the time. He's Grant Gustin's dad in the CW show. He oh, no way. And he also uh, reprises his role as Barry Allen Flash in like a crisis event. It was oh, awesome. sweet. Yeah, it's on it. Netflix if you want to like look. Yeah, I'm too lazy, dude. I know, you gotta dig. (laughs) I'm not gonna lie. I love superheroes and comic books and stuff, but lately the movies are too much. I think we're starting to experience superhero fatigue a little bit. Mm. I think it's just, it's starting to get a little like, it's too, almost too much content. Yeah. You know, it's saturated. There's so much like you have to follow. You have to watch this one to get the reference to this one. Yeah, and then like streaming services happen, like especially with the pandemic. So like Disney made a lot of shows, and it is it is a lot. But I I, I just hope it, it it they come up with ways to make it fresh. You know. Mm-hmm. Definitely, I think we're there. But let's close out with one question. Sure. If you're gonna have a superpower, which one is it? Speed would be the obvious one. <laughs> like you get so much shit done. <laughs> but honestly, time travel. I'd probably be like Barry Allen. I'd probably try try to change the past so many times that I fuck it up and have to flashpoint <laughs> myself all the time. But I just like to visit like different times, the past, future, and see what you know, what we as human beings are doing wrong to the planet, or if we even survive in a few hundred years. Mm, I love it. It's like you're playing God. You know, you're like you're like you're choosing the reality you want. Like, oh, this isn't right. I'm gonna go and change that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Again, yo, Jet. Thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate this conversation. It's been so much fun. Aaron, thank you so much, man. Yeah, this is great. We should definitely do it again. Definitely. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure, man. Have a good evening. You too, man. I'll see you. Hey. Again, Jet, thank you for coming on the podcast. I really do appreciate you. Thank you, listeners, for listening. This is Aaron Deliosa for An Immigrant's Life. I'll see you guys later.